Okay, welcome back for part two. So going on to question number five, it says find dy dx for the curve x e to the 2y plus y equals the natural log of 3. Evaluate dy dx at the point 0 comma natural log of 3. So uh, whenever I go ahead and take my derivative, this is an implicit derivative. So every time I take a derivative of a y, we're going to put dy dx. That's just that's a big thing. So my function is e to the 2y plus y equals ln of 3. So I have two different variables here. So it tells me it's going to be a product rule. So product rule says I'll do my derivative of the first thing. So derivative of an x is just 1. I'll keep the other one. Plus, I'll keep my first thing, which is dx. And derivative of e to the 2y, well, that's going to be, the 2y is going to have a little chain rule there. So it would be e to the 2y times 2. And we took a derivative involving the y. So we'll put dy dx there. Because, you know, derivative of 2y, well, that's derivative of y, we'll say dy dx. And then plus, derivative of just a y, well, that's 1, but we'll put dy dx, we'll take a derivative of y. And derivative of natural log of 3, well, natural log of 3, that's just some number. It's a set number. So, that goes to 0. From here, what we can do is we're going to solve for dy dx. So, I'm going to move this e to the 2y to the other side. So, we'll have x e to the 2y. I'll say 2x. I'll just put this 2 over there. e to the 2y dy dx plus dy dx equals negative e to the 2y. And then I can factor up my dy dx. I have 2x e to the 2y plus 1 equals e to the minus, or sorry, minus e to the 2y. And then I can divide over. So that means dy dx is minus e to the 2y over 2x e to the 2y plus 1. And what do I want to check? Well, I'm going to evaluate this when at 0, comma, natural log of 3. So dy dx minus e to the 2 ln of 3 over 2 times 0. It's going to be 0. So this whole bottom thing has just become 1. Uh, using you know log rules, this might have been a second if you used them, but you can move this 2 actually up here to make this instead natural log of 3 squared. So this is sitting as e to the L. Ln of 9. Sorry, that one of those minus signs became. Be, yeah, there we go. And then e to the ln of 9, well, e and ln cancel out, so we'll just get dy dx. And then divide by 1 is just, you know, itself, is minus 9. So it's our answer is negative 9. Okay. And we'll, we'll go in and we'll go to the next one. So this next one says, suppose a five-foot person is walking away from a 20-foot lamppost at a speed of three feet per second. At what rate is the length of the person's shadow changing? So this one, this is telling me this is a related rates. Makes sense. It's a seven-point problem. It's a lot more than the other ones have been. So I'll draw a picture of this. Okay. I have my triangle. We know that this, uh, this is like the lamppost. You know, that's the light coming off of it. I'm such a good artist. This is 20 feet tall. And when I have my person, I'm going to redraw this because it doesn't make one. Very tall head. And they are five feet tall. And they are walking with a speed of three feet per second. So we need to figure out uh, what rate is the length of the person's shadow changing. Well, the shadow is going to be from here on. We'll call that S. And we know at what rate it's changing. So what we're looking for is we want ds dt. The other thing we know is we have, we know this is that person's distance, which we'll call x. And we know that their speed is changing, x is changing, or dx dt is 3 feet per second. So if I can find a way to relate s, this 5, this 20, and x, I can take a derivative and I'll get my ds dt and my dx dt, and now I can solve. So... What I'm going to use is similar triangle. So the proportion from S to 5, this little mini triangle on the inside, needs to be the same as this big triangle, which is X plus S over 20. 
which I will then cross multiply. So we'll have 20s needs to equal 5x plus 5s. And I'll subtract my 5s over. So 15s equals 5x. Now I'm going to take my derivative with respect to time. So derivative of 15s is going to be 15. The s disappears, but because we took a derivative involving s, we'll put it ds dt. Over here, it's going to be derivative of 5x is just 5. We took a derivative involving x, so we'll put dx dt. Now, we know what dx dt is, but we're looking for ds dt. So 15 times ds dt, don't know what that is yet, so what we're looking for equals 5 times 3. 5 times 3 is 15. And now, we can divide each side by 15. So it means ds dt has to equal 1. Our unit is feet per second. So our answer here is just 1. Going on to this next one. Uh, answer the following questions based on the graph of y equals f of x. Assume that all critical points, the points of the and behavior f can be observed from the graph. Asymptotes are indicated by dotted lines. Give the value for each of the following. The first one, and we use d and e also, infinity or negative infinity, is the limit as x approaches 4. So I'm going to look at, as I approach 4 from the left side, in the right side, what y value am I close to? Well, on the right side, I'm at negative 1 constantly. On this other side, I'm at closer and closer to negative 1. Okay? Well, uh, this one is df dx, the derivative of x, or in other words, the slope, at x equals negative 7. So that means, what is the slope of this part? Well, this looks like a straight line. In how much do we rise? Well, from here to here. From there to there, we go from 0.5, and from here to there, we go over, well, this is point, here's my 7. So it's a total of, we moved over 1, that direction, and we've gone up half. So, so 0.5, which is our rise over our run of 1, is the same thing as 1 half. Next, it wants the integral from 5 to 6. Well... Integral, another way we think about it is area under a curve. But the thing is, that we're, we're like literally like underneath our axis. So if I can find the area of this box, because I'm below the x-axis, whatever I get is, I need to make sure I flip the sign. So, the area of this box, well, this box is 1 wide, 5 to 6, and the, it has a height of 1. So 1 times 1 is 1. So the area is 1, but because it's below the axis, we've got to make it negative. The other way you can have thought about this is we could have just said this is a height of negative 1. Then we don't have to make it negative at the end. Either way it works. So once, once f prime at negative 4, well, at negative 4, what is our slope? Well, that looks like, like a critical point. It looks like a minimum or a max, or a, specifically a minimum. Notice how, you know, from the left I'm going down, my slope's negative, to the right it's positive, that means it must be changing sign there, so that means our slope is zero right there. So this one says to find the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the left. So looking at only from the left, as I get closer to negative 2, what y value am I getting close to? Well, that is 3. This limit as delta x approaches 0 of f of 8 plus delta x, minus f of 8 over delta x. This question is basically saying is, here's the, um, the equation of the derivative, uh, but kind of put it a different way. Instead of h's, we're using delta x's, and our the point that we're evaluating the derivative at is 8. So this whole thing, it's a fancy way of saying just f prime of 8. Like, do you recognize your definitions from the beginning? So if I try to find the slope at 8, well, again, it's a straight line. From here to here, I go down 1, and from here to here, I go right one, so negative one over one, which is our slope, it's just negative one, and that's our answer. This one's was the limit. As x approaches two from the right of our derivative. So basically, if I think about my derivative function, I get close to x on the right side. Like what is the slope on this right side? of 2. Well, again, it's a straight line. I kind of drew a little bit too much on it, so I'll take that off. Well, I know from here to here, those look like pretty solid points. I'm going to go up.
from four to two and a half, so it's up 1.5. How far over I'm gonna go? I'm gonna go one. So th this is like 1.5 over one, which you could just say is 1.5, or I'll put it as a fraction. Three halves, either one works. The limit as x approaches six, well, it was just the total limit, so we're looking at it from the left and the right side. Make sure they match, so let's approach six from the left side. We can closer and closer to negative one, and from the right side, we can closer and closer to three. Those don't match, so it does not exist. Now it wants us to think about the second derivative at seven. So we're gonna find where seven is. Seven's like right here. Well, it's a straight line, so that means that our derivative there is just a number. So if you take a derivative at, of a number, right? We actually figure out what our derivative is here earlier. The, the derivative there is negative one. Well, what's the derivative of negative one? It's zero. And finally, it wants us to find all the x in, in, uh, in the interval where it's continuous but not differentiable, well, that's going to be like sharp points or like hard turns, which right here at x equals 2, like from the left side, our slope is one thing. You know, from the right side, it's something else. On the right side, it's positive. On the left side, it's going to be negative. But the thing is, it's not like they're going close to 0, right? Like right here, the slope looks like 3 halves. Here it looks like, oh, maybe it's getting a little closer to zero, but those slopes on each side don't match. They have to both be going to zero on each side. So it's gonna be at x equals two. So next up, uh, we gotta evaluate each of these integrals. Uh, these first, this first one is indefinite. So remember, we're gonna put a plus c on this, whatever we do. Uh, whenever we do our integral, we can, if it's like add or subtracted, we can do them separately. So the first integral of x to the fifth well, that's the power rule, so we'll just increase the power by 1. Divide by a new power. Next is integral of sine. Well, antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. So we'll say this is plus cosine of x. You take a derivative of cosine of x, you get negative sine of x. So that makes sense. Plus. So it's 5 to the x. The derivative of 5 to the x would be ln of 5 times 5 to the x. But we're trying to go backwards, right? So what I'm going to say, this is going to be 1 over ln of 5 times 5 to the x, because if I take a derivative of this thing, I'll get that extra ln of 5, and those cancel, and I'll just get a 5 to the x. So it's kind of weird. You kind of think backwards, right? Like, when I take a derivative of this, i got to end up back up there. So when I take a derivative, I'll get that extra ln of 5, and I want that to cancel out, so I'll have an 1 over ln of 5. And finally, don't forget, plus C. It's indefinite. We can't, we can't just leave it there. We've got to make sure we put our plus C. And that is our answer. Next one, it's our integral from 0 to pi over 2 of cosine of theta over 1 plus sine squared of theta. My first thought here is I see stuff involving theta here and stuff involving theta there. But let me try a U, like a U sub. So I'm going to say my U is sine of theta. Well, if that's my u, then my du would be cosine of theta d theta. Well, I have a cosine of theta d theta. That Would you look at that? So it means integral from u equals 0 to u equals pi over 2. Go remember, our bounds are, st or sorry, theta equals 0 to theta equals pi over 2. That's my bad. Our bounds don't change from theta to u. They're going to stay in terms of theta of du over 1 plus u squared. Well, when we go ahead and integrate that, we'll get arctan of u evaluated from theta equals pi over 2, to, from, from theta equals 0 to theta equals pi over 2. So from here, we should change what our put back in our u. So arctan of sine of theta from theta equals 0, theta equals pi over 2, which gives us arctan of sine, sine of pi over 2 is 1, minus arctan sine of z 0 is 0. Arctan of 1 is going to be pi over 4, minus 
an arctan of zero is, I believe, zero. So our answer is pi over four. Something else that you might have done is when you do your u substitution, some people will change their bounds. So they'll say, you know, your, your new bound for u is going to be sine of zero and sine of pi over two, which would have given one and zero. So when they evaluated that, that, it would have been arctan of u from u equals zero to u equals one, which gets the, is going to get you guys the same answer. So either way you do it, I just want to show you that it's going to work either way if you change your bounds or don't change your bounds. Just if you don't change them, you've got to be really careful about subbing back in your u. Okay. The last one on this page is ddx of uh, from of the integral of 1 to the square root of x of natural log of uh, 4t. Well, we can use our fundamental theorem of calculus, which tells us that ddx of just like any number to x, it's just of whatever, whatever function it is. It's just going to be f of x. We're going to use that, but the one thing we have to be careful with is that this is not an x. This is an x to the 1 half, which is the square root. So when we try to use our fundamental theorem, we're going to have a chain rule involved. So what's going to happen here is it's going to look like natural log of 4 square root of x, but we have to multiply on the outside by the derivative of x to the 1 half, which is 1 half x to the negative 1 half. And that is our answer. So that's it for this part. We're pretty simple part, post part three. So see you there.